Good morning, dear Sangha. Um, today is uh, August the 16th in the year 2005, and we are in Stonehill College uh, on our last day of the retreat. The purpose of uh, meditation is to touch reality and to, to understand our true nature. If we learn, if we know how to die, if we know how to die, and then we will know how to live. And birth and death are linked to each other. And without understanding about death, we cannot understand about life. And today, let us uh, practice uh, looking deeply together uh, into the topic of uh, birth and death. And this is not uh, really a talk, this is uh, a session of uh, collective uh, practice. And please uh, participate fully into the practice. This summer in, in Europe, uh, the Portuguese uh, suffer very much about, about um, because of uh, fire. And the fire has destroyed so much. I'd like to invite you to, uh, to observe, uh, to look deeply into the nature of a flame. To understand the birth and death of a flame. If we are capable of understanding the birth, the coming into being of a flame, the death, the ending of a flame, we would be able to understand our true nature, to understand our birth and our death. This is a, a mesh box. Produced in the United States of America. And if you look into the mesh box, you can see the flame. We know that the flame is there, hidden somewhere in the mesh box. We cannot say that the flame is not there. It is somewhere there, somehow there. It has not manifested, but we cannot qualify it as non-existing. In the month of uh, April, the farmers around Plum Village, they plow the land and they planted the seed of uh, sunflowers. And in the month of May, if you come to Plum Village, you don't see any sunflowers. But that's not true. The sunflowers are already there. And it needs, uh, they need some more conditions in order to manifest. So the heat of uh, June will help the sunflowers to manifest. And if you come to Plum Village in the month of uh, July, you see that Plum Village is surrounded by sunflowers. So when the sunflowers have not manifested themselves, you cannot say that they do not exist.
The same thing is true with the flame. You don't see the flame, but you cannot say that the flame is not there. It is hidden there. It needs uh, one or two conditions in order, one or two more conditions in order to manifest. And that is true with everything, with a flower, with a cloud, with a child. We know that this hall is filled with uh, television, radio signals. Because we don't have uh, a television set, that is why we cannot perceive the signals. It's filled with the signals. We cannot qualify them as non-existing. So what you do not perceive, you cannot say that it's not there. They may need one or two conditions for you to be able to recognize them. When we look deeply, we can see that the flame is hidden somewhere in the box and also outside of the box. Outside of the box, there is oxygen. And we know very well that without oxygen, a flame can never manifest. And the flame might be in my fingers, because uh, with my fingers, I can offer one last condition for the flame to manifest. So when we practice looking deeply, because we made it Dating means looking deeply. You will see things that other people don't see. And you can already talk to the flame. You say, my dear little flame, I know you are there. I don't qualify you as non-existing, even before your manifestation. And you can hear the flame say, yes, you are right. And we tell the flame, dear little flame, I will bring another condition for you to manifest. I know you are there, please manifest yourself. And the flame manifest. There is a perception of the flame. Before its manifestation, before its manifestation, we could not say that the flame did not exist. That is why when it has manifested, we cannot say that it is, it is existing anymore. It is existing either. I want to repeat that sentence. Before it has not manifested, we could not say that it did not exist. And after the manifestation, we cannot say that it exists either. Uh, we are confused about the notion of uh, to be and not to be. These are very uh, uh, deluding uh, concepts. We might ask uh, the little flame. We might ask the little flame, dear, my dear little flame, where have you come from?
ท่านแห่แห่อยู่กันแล้ if you really ask the question with all your concentration you can hear the answer given by the flame dear Thai dear Sangha I have not come from anywhere I have not come from the east I have not come from the west from the north from the south when conditions are sufficient I manifest to you and we know that the flame is right it has not come from the east or the west the north and the south so the true nature of the flame is the nature of no coming can one can someone come up and write the word no coming on the board no coming and we human beings we are like the flame our nature is the nature of no coming so when people ask you where do you come from well, you can say I come from New Jersey New Jersey but you can say that I have come from nowhere <laughs> and you can touch the ultimate only when you offer the second you can help the other person touch the ultimate only if you give him or her the second answer and we continue to ask the flame where have you gone because we believe that it is no longer there my dear little flame where have you gone and if we, if we listen deeply you will hear dear Thay, dear Sangha I have not gone anywhere I have not gone to the east, to the west, to the north, to the south my nature is no going. When things, when conditions are sufficient, I manifest. When conditions are no longer sufficient, I hide myself. I stop manifest. I stop, I stop manifesting in order to manifest in other ways. There again. The flame is, is right. It has not come from anywhere, from north, from south. And that is why the true nature of the flame is the nature of no coming, no going. I think Brother Fapu has to stay here. Who begin as a novice at the age of uh, 13, 14, 14. He, is, he has been doing very well. Happy novice, happy monk. Look at this uh, tiny piece of paper and look with your concentration. When I look deeply into this sheet of paper, I can see I can see a flower, a, a cloud floating in it. 
You don't need to be a poet in order to see a cloud in a piece of paper. We know very well that if uh, no, if there is no, if there were no cloud, there would be no rain, and the trees would not be able to grow. And without the trees, you cannot uh, make uh, the paste for the paper. So really, the cloud is in here. It's inside the paper. Paper is made of non-paper elements, and the cl- and water cloud is one of these non-paper elements. You can see the rain, you can see the forest, the trees. With the eyes of a practitioner of meditation, you can see things that people, other people, cannot see. When I touch. The sheet of paper, I touch the forest, I touch the trees. If you remove the forest, if you remove the trees from the sheet of paper, the sheet of paper cannot be there for you. So I touch the cloud, I touch the trees. And you know that uh, the trees carry the earth without the earth and the minerals underneath, the trees cannot grow up. And therefore, when I touch the paper, the tree, I touch the earth, I touch the minerals. They're all here. And when I touch the sheet of paper, I touch the sunshine. Without the sunshine, no trees can grow. I can touch the sun without burning my finger. And that is why we, we see that uh, everything can be found, can be touched in a sheet of paper. And now as we ask uh, about the coming of the sheet of paper, and we discover the same thing. The paper has not come from anywhere. It only manifests itself in the form of a sheet of paper. And before taking the shape of uh, a sheet of paper, it has been other things like the trees, the cloud, the sunshine. So this is only a continuation. This is not a creation. To create means from nothing you become something. From no one, you suddenly become someone. But this is not. The paper has not come from nothing. It has come from the trees, from the sunshine, from the cloud, from the earth, from the worker in the mirror. So the nature of the sheet of paper is the nature of no birth. To be born, We think that uh, to be born means from nothing, you suddenly become something. From non-being, you become being. From no one, you become someone. That means to be born. That means birth. But looking deeply, we see that uh, before taking the shape of a sheet of paper, the sheet of paper had been something else. And you can point to the trees, and the trees can be seen here. Dear Thay, dear Sangha, in my former life, I have been a tree. I have been a cloud. And there, we can believe the sheet of paper. It is telling us the truth. And the true nature of the sheet of paper is the, the, the nature of no, no coming, no birth. And that is true with the flame also. You and if the sheet of paper has never been born, because the moment 
we believe to be the moment of birth is only a moment of continuation. It's like a cloud. When it, uh, it becomes uh, rain, that is not a moment of death. That is only a moment of continuation. Because to die in our mind, to die means from something you become nothing at all. You become a nothing. From someone, you suddenly become no one. And it is impossible for a cloud to die. You cannot reduce a cloud to nothing. A cloud can only become the rain, the snow, the hell, the ice. But uh, it is impossible for a cloud to die, to become nothing. So the nature, the true nature of a cloud is no death, no coming, no going, no birth, no death. The sheet of paper is like that too. Even if I burn the sheet of paper, I cannot reduce it into nothingness. If you observe the burning of a sheet of paper, I can ask the flame to do so, but we are powerful enough to see without the form. And in the process of burning, we can see the manifestation of heat. Be careful, uh, you burn your finger. And the heat penetrates into Thai, into all of you, into the cosmos. That is a continuation of the paper. The stopping of one form of uh, manifestation is at the same time the beginning of other forms of manifestation. And because you, you observe it with all your concentration, you see smoke rising. Again, smoke rising is a new continuation of the piece of paper. And then we can look up and say, bye bye, sheet of paper. See you again soon. Because the sheet of paper is now in its new form smoke. It will join a cloud. And tomorrow we may encounter it again in the form of a rain drop right here on our forehead. We have to recognize the sheet of paper in its new manifestation. The heat that is now in us that is now in the cosmos, the smoke that is now in the sky, and maybe tomorrow in our cup of tea. And that is what uh, practitioners of meditation can see. (coughs) And then the some ash, ash ashes left, and the novice can put the ash uh, back to the ground. And maybe in a few years, we have another retreat in Stonehill. And you see a grass blade, which is the continuation of the ashes. So you cannot reduce something to nothing at all. A sheet of paper, like a cloud, can never die. It can only be transformed into other forms. And that is why the true nature of the flame, the true nature of the paper, the true nature of the cloud is a nature of no coming, no going, no birth, 
no death. No birth, no death. And modern science can help us to see it more clearly also. The French uh, scientist uh, Lavoisier said that uh, nothing is born, nothing dies. Rien ne se crée, rien ne se perd. He was not a Buddhist, but he did practice looking deeply, and he found the same thing. There's no birth, no death. In the morning, in this morning, we recited the Heart Sutra. There's no creation, no destruction, no birth, no death. And Lavoisier, use exactly the same terms. Rihanna Sucre, Rihanna Sucre. Nothing is born, nothing dies. And that is the nature of a cloud, of a sheet of paper, of a flame. And it is also our true nature. Our nature is the nature of no birth and no death. Before the manifestation of something, you might tend to believe that some that something has not exist, existed. We draw a line. We draw a line <coughs> representing time. Present time. And the left, we, we take a, a spot and we consider it to be birth B. After B, you can see the Manifestation, manifestation, and you tend to qualify it as a being, being, existing. But before be, you tend to think that it is non-being, non-existing. Remember the flame. Before we have it manifest, we already knew that it was there. We cannot qualify it as non-being, non-existing. So the section before B cannot be qualified as non-being, cannot be qualified of non-existing. And if the section, the segment before B could not be qualified as being Uh, non-being, the section that come after B cannot be qualified as being uh, non-being either. This is very important. It is only a continuation. If you believe like uh, Paul Tillich, that God is the foundation of being. And how could you answer the question, who, what is the foundation of non-being?
because if we have the notion being, we have also the notion non-being. And being and non-being are creations of our mind. They cannot be applied to reality. The ultimate reality is free from the six notions that you have mentioned. Coming, going, birth, death, being, and non-being. Every one of us has a birth date. And we really believe that uh, we did not exist before our birth. But that is not true. Everyone knows that. We have been there in the womb of our mother for a long time. At least six months, uh, nine months. <laughs> and if something is already there, why it needs to be born. Because in our mind, to be born means from nothing, you become something. From no one, you become someone. So we tend to believe that our birth is really the moment of uh, conception, our conception in the womb of our mother. mother. <coughs> anyway, it is more, it's closer to the truth than uh, than the date on our birth certificate, the moment of our conception. But it's not uh, the, the truth yet. Because uh, before that moment, we had been already there. Because uh, it was not nothing. It was not known, known being before uh, we manifest as a, a fetus. We have been maybe half in our father, in our mother. We have been, have been, have always been there. And on, and not only the moment of our birth is a, a moment of continuation, but the moment of our conception is also a moment of continuation. We can qualify it as before that as non-existing. We had been there before, in our father, in our ba- mother, in our ancestors, a long continuation. So we are on our path, our way to look for ourselves. I want to see the true face of ourselves, the true uh, nature, the true origin of ourselves. And if uh, we look deeply, we find out that uh, there is no beginning, there is no birth, there is no end, there is no death, there is no coming, there is no going. I want to ask uh, the little flame to manifest again. We need you. Dear little flame, are you the same flame that uh, I have seen before, or are you a different one? And then if you listen deeply, you can hear the flame, dear Thai, dear Sangha. I am not exactly the same flame with, but I am not a totally different flame. When you look at the sun, or the daughter. You can see the father in the son, the mother in the son, 
the father and the daughter, the mother and the daughter. Because the son is a continuation of the father and the mother, the daughter also a continuation of the father and the mother. Like a plant of corn is a continuation of the grain of corn that we have planted. Looking deeply, we see that the plant, the, the, the seed of corn, the grain of corn has not died. In fact, it, it has become the plant of corn. And as uh, we are practitioners of meditation, we don't need the form of the grain of corn to recognize it as being there. We just look at the, the corn, the plant of corn, and we can see the seed of corn. The plant of corn is the continuation of the seed of corn. They are neither the same nor a different entity. They inter are. In the plant of corn, you see the grain of corn, and in the grain of corn, you see the plant of corn. When you look into your family album, you may see your picture as a five-year-old boy, five-year-old girl, or the picture of your father, your mother as a five-year-old child. And now, you are 30, you are 50, or your, mother, your father uh, is 50 or 60. Are you the same person with the five-year-old child? They took your picture when you were five, and now you compare that picture with you, you see a big difference. Forms feelings, perceptions, mental formations, consciousness, everything has changed. So different. You, you still bear the same name, David, Henry, but the reality is not exactly the same. You have changed so much from 5 to 50. So if you are asked, whether you are the same with the five-year-old child. You cannot say exactly, I am. I, uh, I am the same person with the five-year-old child. It's me, because you look so different, and you feel so different. So the better answer is that I am neither the same nor a different one. The son is also the continuation of the father. The father is the continuation of the father when he was uh, five years old. And the son is also a continuation of the father. And that is why looking deeply, he sees his father fully present in him. You cannot take your father out of you. You cannot take your mother out of you. That is the fact. Even if you hate your father, if you hate your mother, you cannot remove him or her out of you. They are actually in you. Because you are his, her continuation. That is the fact. So getting angry at him, means getting angry at yourself. Getting angry at her means getting angry at yourself. The only alternative is to reconcile with him inside of you. Dear Father, I know you have suffered. You have not had an opportunity to learn and to practice loving kindness and Understand, understanding. That is why you have made them yourself suffer and you have made me suffer. I am your continuation. I vow to do better. I want to transform. 
transform myself means transform yourself. And this transformation is for my children also. Because I keep, if I keep that in me untransformed, uh, I be continued in a very much the same way. I will transmit the afflictions, the habit energies, the suffering to my children. Therefore, I make up the aspiration to transform our afflictions. And when I transform my afflictions, I transform yours in me. I vow to do better because now I have conditions to do so. So when you talk to yourself like that, when you talk to your father like that, anger in you will vanish. Dear mother, I know that you have suffered a lot in the past. You did not know the way to handle the suffering. That is why you became a victim of your own suffering. And we also, your children, have become also victims of that suffering. But never mind, mother. Now I know how to work to transform that affliction in me. And if I can transform that affliction in me, you are transformed in me. And we will not transmit that again to our children and grandchildren. And if you can talk to your mother in me like that, your anger for your mother will vanish. That is emancipation. That is freedom by insight. In the Buddhist tradition, we do not uh, speak about um, uh, um, emancipation, uh, sa- uh, salvation uh, by grace. We speak about salvation, emancipation by insight. And insight is what we get with the practice of looking deeply. And the Buddhist tradition offer us the techniques, the way, the practice of looking deeply so that we can get the insight. And that insight will help transform the suffering in us and in other people. If you understand grace as uh, understanding and compassion, then we can use the word grace. Salvation, transformation, freedom through understanding, through compassion, through insight. If you are too busy, you have no time enough to live deeply, to look deeply, and therefore we don't have the insight that we need in order to transcend fear and anger and despair. The other day I told you the story of a couple uh, in Germany. Um, they got married during the retreat. And the next day they were come up and uh, they were asked to come up and uh, play something to, to express their insight. And the new husband looked anxiously at uh, his bride and asked the question, Darling, are you the same person I married yesterday? And then with a smile, she looked at him and said, Don't worry, darling. Although I am not exactly the same person, I am not another person either. And that is the truth. Because the truth is everything changes. That is the truth of impermanence. The truth, the reality of impermanence has been recognized by wise people, East and West, North and South. We know that things are impermanent and we also are impermanent. We change. That is why we cannot remain the same thing, the same person forever. And impermanence means non-self. 
Self is an unchanging entity. Looking deeply into five uh, elements that make ourselves form, feelings, perceptions, mental formation, and consciousness, we see that they are rather a process, a processes, and not a thing. It's like it has the nature of uh, cinematography. Always changing. They, they give impression that you are always the same person. You are always the same thing. But the fact is not. You are ever changing. And the idea of uh, a permanent self, immortal soul, is an illusion given by the fact of continuation. It's like during uh, the night, you, you hold a thought and you draw a circle and you continue to do it quickly and standing from far away, they see a circle of fire. But there is no circle of fire at all. There is a continuation of dots that give the impression of uh, a fire circle. So Henry Burson has said that consciousness has the nature of a uh, has a cinematographic nature. Because you take a picture, and you take another picture, and you take another picture, and if you allow the pictures to continue, you have the impression that it's someone that is doing something. And there is an enduring entity, unchanging entity you may call the soul or self. But if you accept the fact that everything is impermanent, you have to accept also there is no permanent entity that you may call soul as self. And that's why life is possible. If the soul is impermanent, if the self remains the same thing, it would be impossible for transformation and healing. On the right, we may, we may choose a spot and we write the word D means death. And many of us believe that after D, there will be nothing. How could it be? The people who speak, uh, who ask the question whether there is life after death. There is life after death. It would be better to, see that, uh, to say that life after life. Because if, uh, if it is really death, and then how could it... Uh, be any light, any life after. That's not really death. That is also a moment of continuation. Continuation in other forms. When we burn a sheet of paper, that is not the death of a paper. This is a moment of continuation. The paper will be born in uh, smoke, in heat, in ash to continue. 
So looking deeply, we can see that the moment uh, death is uh, an idea. And if you can see that death is an idea, you don't have to suffer. When you contemplate the sky, you might fall in love with a certain cloud. The clouds are impermanent, you know that. Our beloved one is also impermanent. There is a moment when the cloud has to be transformed into rain. And when the cloud is no longer in the form of a cloud, we believe that the cloud is dead. It's no longer there. That is why we have a lot of grief, of despair. But the cloud is still there in its new form. It's calling to you, darling, darling, I'm here. Don't you see me? And then you need to have the eyes of a practitioner of meditation in order to recognize your beloved cloud in the rain. And you're free from grief, from despair. Your beloved one is always there in you, around you. You need to have uh, the eye of wisdom in order to recognize him or her in her new continuation. Holding the cup of tea in my hand, I look deeply and I see that uh, this tea that I drink has been Rain has been cloud. And I get in touch with uh, the cloud and this new life. And when I drink the tea, I get in touch with the cloud and the rain. I am drinking clouds every day. Anyway, there's a lot of cloud in me. <laughs> Seventy percent, at least, of me is made of clouds. <laughs> Why do I have to cry over the death of a cloud? The person I love is in me and around me. I can touch, get in touch with him, with her at any moment if I have the eyes of wisdom. I suffer, I despair because I don't have the insight. That is, why, that is why insight delivers us from suffering and despair. If one day you hear through your email or your telephone that he has died, don't believe it. <laughs> My nature is the nature of no death. If you look hard, harder, you see me around you and inside of you. Don't believe in fax, telephone, email. (laughs) And we know that the segment from B to D is a form of manifestation. You cannot qualify it as being or non-being. In the segment after D, is the manifestation of the same thing in different forms. You cannot say that. You cannot qualify them as non-being, of non-existing. And the notion of uh, being and non-being should be transcended. The notion of birth and death also. We have written on the board, uh, no coming, no going, no birth, no death. No being, no non-being. I have not written on it, the other couple. 
neither the same nor a different one. No same, no difference. You are the son, you are the daughter, you are the father, you are the mother. Look at yourself, look at your children, and touch the nature of neither the same nor a difference. And that insight will restore communication, love, harmony, and dissipate all fear, all anger. This morning, when we bow, when we touch the earth in gratitude to our parents, we said, Dear parents, we want to continue with you in beauty. We, we vow to do better. And parents always want their child, their children to do better. I always want my disciples my spiritual children to do better than me. And when you you communicate with your parents, you are just like that. They, are, they will be very happy. And with that communication, there is no longer any anger, any frustration. You are filled with compassion, understand. The purpose of our life is not to get a lot of money or fame, because many people who suffer deeply, even if they have a lot of power, a lot of fame. But those of us who have plenty of understanding and compassion, we are very happy. And that is uh, the success, the biggest success of our life, because we have plenty in order to offer. Plenty of what? Plenty of understanding. Plenty of love. And that is the, the most important, a real success of our life. Cultivating understanding and love, and not money and power. The Buddha did not spend a lot of time talking about uh, how the world started and things like that. Because he, his main concern is to offer the teaching and practice that can help people overcome their suffering. My teaching is about ill being, suffering, and the, transcend, and, and the way to transcend ill being and suffering. He always repeats that. We do not have time to engage in metaphysical speculations. That is why he did not spend time to answer questions like uh, whether the world is limited or unlimited, whether there is a boundary to the cosmos and not. He did not spend his time like uh, Albert Einstein to do uh, these kind of things. But through his teaching, we can detect the fact that he has a lot of wisdom, a lot of uh, insight about the nature of life, of reality, of the human being. And uh, he spoke of the ultimate like this. There is something that is beyond beginning, ending, up and down, being and non-being. If uh, that is not there, there will be no escape for beginning, ending, up, down, being and non-being. He said something like that in Udana, and he and we refer to it as Nirvana. Nirvana is the ultimate. Let us visualize a wave, 
a wave forming on the surface of the ocean. And visualize that we are that wave. There is a point of uh, of uh, beginning. We start rising. And we will start falling. That is the description of a of a wave. You can describe a wave as having a beginning and end, as high or low, as more beautiful or less beautiful than other waves. But. Um, The life, uh, the wave, there is a possibility that the wave can live uh, her life as a wave and at the same time live her life as water. There are two dimensions to reality. The first dimension is called the historical dimension, where it seems to have uh, a beginning and end, birth and death, high or low, being and non-being. But if we touch the historical dimension deeply, we touch the ultimate dimension. It's like if we touch the wave deeply, we touch the water in it. Because the ultimate dimension and the and the historical dimension they are not separated. The moment when the wave get in touch with water and realize that she is water, she will lose all her fear, her jealousy, her despair. Before that, she was caught in the idea of beginning, ending. High, low, more or less beautiful, she's victim of fear, of jealousy, of craving. But once she touched her true nature of water, she knows that she is deathless, birthless, no beginning, no end. And the true nature of the wave is the water. And the water doesn't have to run after uh, the wave does not have to run after water. It would be funny if a wave is in search of water. <laughs> but we humans, we are, many of us are running, searching for our ultimate reality. We are running to look for God, for Nirvana. From the beginning or from the non-beginning, the wave has been water. And our ground is the ground of the ultimate. Our true nature is the nature of no birth, no death. No coming, no going. Neither the same nor a different entity. No being, no non being. And uh, we also have uh, our historical dimension like a wave. We might be caught in the notion of birth and death, being and non being, coming or going. That is why we suffer. But when we are capable of touching our true nature, the nature of nirvana. We transcend all these notions and we become free. We are no longer af- afraid of birth, death, coming, going, being and non-being. And those of us who are afraid of uh, being and we want to escape by killing ourselves, we are seeking non-being. But being and non-being are just ideas. 
notions. And nirvana means the absence of all notions, especially the four pairs of notions that we have talked about this morning. No coming, no going, no birth, no death, no being, no non-being, no same, not the same, not a different one. Because these notions are at the foundation of all our fear, our suffering, our afflictions. And that is why nirvana can be defined as uh, the absence of notions and the absence of afflictions born from these notions. And the ultimate aim of meditation is to touch our nature and to transcend all fear. Of course, when we when we come to the practice center, by practicing, we can get a lot of relief and transformation. But the biggest relief, the most important relief, we can get only when we can touch our true nature, the nature of no birth and no death, no coming and no going. And that we need time in order to look deeply, in order to touch our true nature. That is why nirvana is not something we run after. Nirvana is our, the ground of our manifestation. And nirvana is free from the notion of being and not being. If we speak about God, we speak about the ultimate. And we can say nothing about the ultimate. If we say that God is the ground of being, and then we get stuck because if God is the ground of being, who will be the ground of non-being? Because if we entertain the notion of being, we have to respect and recognize that there is the other notion, the notion of non-being. But for Nirvana, Nirvana is not the ground of being. It's not the ground of non-being either. Because these two notions are just uh, mental constructions. And we suffer because of our mental constructions. Please look and realize that. All suffering comes from our mind, not from outside. The foundation of our suffering is our mind. And the foundation of our happiness and freedom is also our mind. Understanding our mind. Removing wrong perceptions, false notions, and then we will be free and we will be enlightened and we will not suffer anymore. If the Buddha has been able to do it, do it as a human being, we can do it too. There have been generations of students that follow the Buddha, and many of them have realized what the Buddha has realized. Touching our true nature of no birth and no death, and become free, and then Without fear, true happiness is possible. When you come to a practice center, when you come to a teacher, a sangha, of course you have the opportunity to get relief from your suffering. But ask for the greatest relief, touching the ultimate in order to be totally 
free from fear. That is uh, the greatest gift the Buddha wants to offer. The Buddha had uh, many uh, monastic disciples and lay disciples who loved him dearly. Uh, that there was a lay person, a lay disciple of the Buddha whose name is uh, Anatta Pindika. He was a businessman. He has a, a very good heart. He devoted his time, energy, and material resources in order to support the poor. The poor people, the lonely people. And that is why uh, people in the city of Shravasti gave him that name, Anatta Penika the one who support uh, the destitute, the poor, the lonely. His real name is Sudatta. The moment uh, that young uh, businessman met the Buddha, he fell in love with the teacher, and he wanted to offer a practice center to him in his own country, in the city of Shravasti. At that time, the Buddha was in the south, in Rajagra, uh, in the country of Magadha. It was only a few years after enlightenment, when the Sangha was still uh, small, well, small but more than 1,000 monks. And uh, the Buddha accepted his invitation to come to Shravasti to offer the teaching. And uh, Anathabhidika asked um, the Buddha to, to allow one disciple of, monastic disciple of his to accompany him so that they together they can prepare the ground for the teaching of the Buddha in the new country. So Shariputra, one of uh, the outstanding monastic uh, disciples of the Buddha, was uh, appointed to go with Anatta Penika, and they walk many, many days in order to go back to Shravasti. And Anathapitika found a very beautiful park. And he wanted to offer to the Buddha as a practice center. He bought it. He bought it from a prince. And when the Buddha arrived with his uh, monastic Sangha, he supported the Buddha and the Sangha to organize retreats, Dhamma talks, and so on. And the king of Travasti came also uh, to listen to the Dhamma talks. And a few months later, the king became one of the closest uh, friends of the Buddha. They are of the same age. They are very close to each other. Anathapitika, as a businessman, supported the Buddha and the Sangha for more than 30 years. And he took a great deal of happiness in supporting uh, the Dharma, the teaching, and the growing, the growth of uh, the Sangha. 
he had so many friends. Once he was, um, he, he suffered a bankruptcy, but he did not really suffer because he had so many friends that came to him and helped him to restart uh, the business. So many friends. One day the Buddha learned that uh, Anatta Padika is very sick. And the Buddha came to visit him. And after that he appointed Sariputra, his beloved uh, monastic disciple, to take care of Anatta Padika because they are very close friends. One monastic and one lay person, very close to each other. One day, Shariputra learned that Anatta Penika was dying. So he invited his uh, younger brother in the Dharma, the Venerable Ananda, to come with him to visit uh, Anatta Pidika and to help him die peacefully and happily. When they arrived, Anatta Pidika tried his best to sit up, but he, his uh, strength betrayed him. He could not sit up. Shariputra said, Dear friend, stay on your bed. We will bring two chairs. We sit very close to you. Then after the two monks have seated, Shariputra asked this question, My dear friend, how do you feel in your body? Is the pain in your body increasing? Or it has begun to decrease. And uh, Anatta Pedika said, uh, Dear Venerables, it does not seem that the pain in my body is decreasing. It is increasing all the time. I suffer very much. And when Sariputra hear that, he decided to offer a guided meditation in order to bring the level of uh, pain down. And that is the practice of uh, uh, um, of, uh, of the, the, the four recollec- recollections. Uh, let your mind dwell on four subjects. The Buddha is a subject, the Dharma is a subject, the Sangha is a subject, and the mindfulness training is a subject. Sariputra is one of the most intelligent disciples. He knew exactly what uh, Anathapitika needs. If uh, he can bring the mind of Anatta Pinika, focus on the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, or his pain, the pain in his body will decrease. Because uh, he knew him so well, he had taken a lot of pleasure serving the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Every time we think of the Buddha, he feel happy. Every time we think of the Sangha, he feel happy. And he is, is a family that practice uh, with the Buddha. There was one time uh, his boy did not want to come with him to the Madama talk. So that day he pretended that he is uh, um, sick. And he asked his uh, son to go to listen to the Dhamma talk and come back to tell him. And he said, my son, just remember one sentence that is enough. I will you I I give you one thousand rupees. Because the the boy want to spend money buying something. And the boy thought that it's a good deal. <laughs> and he went. 
and he spent most of the time playing outside. But he managed to listen a little bit and he memorized one sentence. Next time, uh, he came in the beginning and he was attracted by the Dharma talk and he got transformation by uh, listening to the Dharma talk. And when he came home, he was ashamed to receive the money. He said, Daddy, I didn't go to the Dharma talk for money. Give your money. So from that time on, uh, the young man continued to come to the Dharma talks. And that is what we call a skillful means. <laughs> you know that there are many uh, Vietnamese parents uh, living in America. It's very difficult to raise them in a new culture. And uh, they believe that if they are, they succeed in sending them to Plum Village, well, we will correct, uh, fix uh, the children for them. They believe like that. They believe Plum Village is kind of machine, they put the child on this. <laughs> <laughs> side and then going through the machine the child will come out very beautiful <laughs> so this summer well many children like that are sent to us and they said children you go to France and you can enjoy many things the Eiffel Tower Paris many wonderful things but when the children arrive, they go to Plum Village. <laughs> There's no television, no el- electronic game, uh, no McDonald's or hamburgers and uh, things like that. They suffer. <laughs> and poor monastic uh, brothers and sisters, they had to handle that group of children. <laughs> Like this one, he had to play with children. Uh, he spoke, he speak English, so he know how his life in Canada, in America. So after a few weeks, uh, the children got used uh, to the way of life in Plum Ridge, and they survived without television and other things. And that is. Uh, I don't know whether I can call it a skillful means or not. But uh, we want more than that. We want the parents to come and to practice with their children. They cannot leave their children to us like that. Because if parents don't uh, practice, and then the relief, the improvement of children will not last very long. Things inter are. If parents don't change, the children cannot uh, retain their practice and their, their joy. I would not call it uh, skillful means. And uh, together, the two monks and uh, the dying person practice the recollection of the Buddha. They focus their attention on the Buddha. And uh, yesterday uh, you have heard uh, the chanting on the four recollections. And the four recollections, the text is printed in the Plum Village uh, chanting book. And after uh, focusing their mind on the Buddha, they focus their mind on the Dharma, on the Sangha, on the mindfulness trainings. And after that, Anatta Pedika felt much better. And he was able to smile. For the person who is dying, 
if you are there. And if you can touch the seed of, of happiness in him or in her. If we know the person, if we know that uh, what kind of joy and uh, grief that person has gone through, you will be able to help him or her. Just be there, talk to him or to her, and help him or her touch the seed of uh, happy memories uh, in him or in her. It will work. It will help restore the balance. And it is easier for him, for her, to bear the pain, not too difficult. Every one of us has the seed of spirit, spirituality, love in us. But when we suffer so much pain, we forget. And if someone comes and touch these seeds, well, we be able to restore the balance and we can smile. Sister Chen Kong, who just sang uh, the, the song to you uh, this morning, she had a sister living in America. And one day uh, in the hospital, uh, the doctors have tried everything in order to to help her to be quiet because uh, she was in a coma. But she had so much suffering and fear within herself. That is why she could not stay calm. Her body was twisting and she emitted the, the sound of her suffering. And even her daughter is a physician. She could not do anything about it. And then Sister Tiangong arrived. And she had a tape, a cassette of the chanting, Namo Valo Varaya. And she put the earphone into the ears of her sister and to begin to play the tape. Till she turned the volume a little bit louder because the sound find it, can find its way in, even if you are in a coma. And the miracle happened. After five, seven minutes, the sister stayed calm, and she stopped emitting the sound of suffering, screaming, and things like that, until she died. Of course, uh, when she was young, she had gone to temple, she had uh, heard uh, the chanting, she had uh, the seat of practice. And if you are able to touch the seat of spirituality, of peace, of faith in her, and then she can grasp that, and she can come back to herself. There is a student uh, in Bordeaux who learned that her mother was uh, dying in Washington, D.C. So he came to Plum Ridge in order to, uh, to get some uh, uh, some uh, recommendations as to what he can do. And uh, 
Sister Jingong told him that if uh, his mother is already in a coma, uh, he, he can still sit there and talk to her. There is a way to communicate with her. Just sit there and talk to her like uh, as, if, as if she is awake and only talk about the happy memories between him and her. Because the doctors have done their best but uh, could not bring her back to uh, being awake. And this time, the miracle happened again. After 40 minutes of talking to his mother, his mother wake up, woke up. And the doctors and nurses are very surprised. So if the other person is already in a coma, you can still do something. You can massage his feet, talk to her, talk to him. And there is a way, there is communication. And Shariputra knew knew that, knew that uh, Shari, uh, Anatta Pindika has a lot of, uh, has uh, many seeds of happiness serving the Dharma, the Sangha, the Buddha. That is why the meditation is to water only these seeds of happiness. And of course, uh, Anatta Pindika uh, restored his balance and was able to smile. You can help him or her to suffer less and to offer a smile. Sariputra has uh, seen that. He said, Dear friend, let us continue with our guided meditation. Let us focus our attention on our in breath and out breath. Breathing in, I know that these eyes, these eyes are not me. I am more than these eyes. These ears are not me. I am more than the ears. This body is not me. I am much more than this body. And then he let Ananda and uh, Anathabhidika through uh, the meditation on the six uh, sense organs and their objects. The sounds are not me. The sight are not me. The perfumes are not me. The taste are not me. I'm much more than that. The element of water in me, the cloud, are not me. I am not attached to it. The element of fire, of heat in me, is not me. I am not attached to it. The element of earth in me is not me. I am not uh, caught in it. The element of air is in me is not me. I am not caught in it. The four elements, air, water, earth, and fire. And that kind of meditation is to help uh, the person not to identify him or her with the body. This body is not me. The, de- the coming into uh, the de- disintegration of this body does not affect me. The body manifests when conditions are sufficient. The body stops his manifestation when the conditions are no longer sufficient. Before the coming 
the manifestation of the body, you cannot say the body it did not exist. After the disintegration of the body, you cannot say that the body does not exist. And this meditation is about to overcome the notion of birth and death, being and non-being. And after that, the Venerable Anana saw the tears begin to stream out of uh, Anatta Pedika's eyes. He was very surprised. He said, my dear friend, why do you cry? Are you, do you still regret anything? Ananda is younger than Shariputra. Anatta Pedika said, mm, Dear Venerable Ananda, I don't regret anything. In that case, uh, maybe you don't practice successfully. No, Venerable Ananda, I practice very, very successfully. But why do you cry then? I cry because I'm so moved. I have served the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha more than 30 years, but I have never received and put into practice such a wonderful teaching that I receive today from the Venerable Shri Buddha. It's wonderful, it's wonderful. And Anatta, still a little bit naive, said, Dear friend, you don't know, but this kind of teaching, we monastic, we receive almost every day. Teaching on no birth, no death. No being, no non-being, etc. And then Anatta Medica look at the, the two venerables and say, Dear Venerable Ananda, please go home and tell the Lord that we lay people, many of us, are too busy, not capable of receiving this teaching and put it into practice. But among us, there are those who are not too busy, who are capable of receiving the teaching and put into the practice. Please tell, this is my last request to the Lord. In fact, that is his last request. The, uh, the Venerable Ananda uh, uh, promised that he will go back and tell the Buddha that. And after that, Anathapadika passed away very peacefully and happily. This story has been recorded in the Pali Canon and the Chinese Canon, the Sanskrit Canon. And uh, I have translated uh, it. And if you want to read again, uh, uh, please find the book, uh, the Plumbly Shending Books, the teaching given to the dying person. And uh, with the practice of looking deeply, uh, you get the insight of no birth and no death. And that is the best that you can offer when you sit close to a person who is dying. You can inspire him or her with non-fear. And you can help him or her die peacefully. In the beginning, I said that if you don't know how to die, and then you don't know how to live. But... Uh, Looking deeply, we see that birth and death, life and death, they inter-are. Without one, the other cannot be. And if we can transcend the notion of birth and death, living and dying, and then we have, we get the freedom, the real freedom. It has been wonderful to be with all of you in this retreat, walking together, sitting together, eating together, breathing together, especially there are many children with us. We have allowed the time to water the wonderful seeds in us, the seed of uh, understanding, the seed of love, the seed of compassion and forgiveness. We feel better now, and we vow to continue the practice. 
we will try our best to set up a sangha where we are, so that we can nourish and maintain our practice. Please go home safely and bring the sangha home into your heart. The sangha will be your support. You know that you have a sangha. It's time to ask the monks and nuns to come and to chant, offering our gratitude to our ancestral teachers and uh, all the friends who have uh, made uh, this uh, retreat uh, um, uh, possible for all of us.